Hey soccer fans, this is Nick with the Feed the Fire podcast, and in tonight's episode, we've got game notes and a glass half full, glass half empty recap of the Fire's home opener against FC Cincinnati. We're also recapping U.S. Soccer Federation's new format for the U.S. Open Cup and previewing the Columbus Crew matchup this coming weekend for the Chicago Fire, and hopefully we can have a little fun along the way as well. So stay tuned. Hey, soccer fans. Welcome back once again to the Feed the Fire podcast. I'm your host, Nick. I'm excited to be talking to you after the Chicago Fire home opener. I am not so excited to be talking to you about the Chicago Fire losing in their home opener. And we're going to talk about everything that went right and what went wrong in that FC Cincinnati matchup. Before we get into that, just a few housekeeping things, a few people I want to recognize. A big shout out to a couple of Chicago Fire fans, Paul and Israel, who have been interacting with me on Twitter, got some emails from them. I just want to say thank you guys for coming up, saying hello at the Chicago Fire game. Paul, coming in from Kenosha, that's dedication uh, to coming to support the Chicago Fire. Israel, bringing your son. Great to see you guys having a good time at the game. So thank you both again for saying hello and for your continued support of the show. Also, want to welcome a new listener, Civics Teacher Mitch, out on Twitter. Thank you for finding us. Thanks for interacting, commenting, and uh, letting me know your thoughts on all things Chicago Fire. Special thanks to Rudy Hodgson, a communications coordinator with the Chicago Fire. He stopped by at halftime to say hi to me and my son. And if you guys ever get the chance to meet Rudy, please make sure you do talk to him. One of the friendliest guys in the organization, and he'll make sure you're well taken care of at any Chicago Fire game. Also, special announcement here. I'm sure you're all familiar with the CHGO network of podcasts, the All City Network, and you all know CHGO Fire and their host, Alex Campbell. Well, I am happy to say uh, that Alex has asked me to be a guest co-host on the show. So depending if you're listening to this, you can still watch live Tuesday, March 5th at 2.30 p.m. Central over on CHGO Sports YouTube channel, or you can go find their podcast and listen to the show after the fact and listen to his and my banter and all things Chicago Fire and the upcoming matches against the crew against Montreal. And they're also bringing in a special guest from the Fire organization, so make sure you go check them out. And a final recognition. We have a lot a lot of people to recognize. That just that tells me. You guys are having fun with the show. I'm having more fun with the show. Word is spreading. You're sharing the news. Keep it up. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, last kind of recognition here, Chicago rapper Jay Woods. He was uh, Jay Wood, excuse me. He was recognized at the Fire Home game from Chicago, has a new song out, Homesick, that they featured at the game. He was there with the crowd saying, hey to everybody, I actually ran into him on the concourse, stopped, talked to me, talked to my son, talked to a friend of ours for, you know, five, seven, ten minutes, just just chit-chatting about being a Chicago Fire fan, being from the city, you know, being a sports fan. Uh, it, it was really cool to, to talk to him and also what he said about his music, like it's it's the emotion, it's the energy that he's feeling that he puts into his songs, and that's what really went into the music and the lyrics for the new song Homesick. So go find him on social media, go find his music, and uh, make sure you give him a listen. He's a fan of the fire. I, I saw some people on Twitter, Twitter trying to get him to come out to one of the supporters group tailgates, so I hope you all can make that work because he seems like just a cool dude and someone who's going to support anything related to his city. All right. Wow. We are already four minutes in and that is just the greetings. This is how big time this show is going, everybody, right? We got to recognize all these people helping to make things happen. Okay. Let's get into the game because there's a lot to get into. I'm going to look at kind of like the pregame stuff, a few game notes, and then we'll get into the nitty gritty and pregame. The new Chicago Fire pregame tradition. Sound the alarm. I love it. I think it's great. I think it's a really cool thing to lean into. Lean into, the obviously, the fire theme, the fire department theme. They have a celebrity from Chicago 
who comes over to the supporter section, and it's the supporter section will present them with the supporter's axe, and they will take this axe and raise it in the air, and every time they raise it in the air, the whole stadium yells, fire, and it was great. The first celebrity to do it, Chicago Bulls player Andre Drummond, and I, I don't think he kind of knew, like, do I keep going with this? Do I stop it? How long do I do it? The fans just kept yelling fire, and he kept putting the axe up. And eventually, uh, I think Gabe Ramirez or someone had to tell him, like, okay, move on to the next thing. But we were just having fun yelling. He was having fun swinging the axe around. He goes up to a large replica of a fire alarm, right? Those little things in, in all your schools and office buildings and hallways, you know, break glass in case of fire, and you pull, pull it down. Well, that's exactly what this is. It was like four feet tall, and he takes the axe, he smashes the glass, pulls down the alarm, and then the fire alarm siren goes off throughout the whole stadium. They've got fire and pyrotechnics coming up from, from pitch side and all around the stadium. Everyone was getting into it. Very, very cool thing to do. Have to real quick sidebar here and just point out that New England has tried a similar new thing where one of their local celebrities throws a box of tea into the harbor. At least that was the idea. Instead, it looked like he was just throwing garbage onto the pitch. It did not did not work out from an execution standpoint. The idea was there. The implementation was not. So I got to say, the Chicago Fire's sound the alarm pregame tradition is much, much, much closer to, say, uh, Atlanta's driving of the Golden Spike than the, the New England tradition of throwing garbage onto the field. Then again, hey, maybe that is just a long-standing East Coast New England tradition. Who am I to say? Also, got to point out real quick, if you are going to the games, there's a lot of expanded activities in the concourse. I remember last season it was kind of like a little kid's area where they could color some signs, a couple inflatable things you could kick a soccer ball in, and, and like giant Connect Four in the bar area. Well, they've expanded that. There's two or three different areas that you can kick a soccer ball around and some inflatables. I wish the speed gun was working. They had a spot where you could shoot a soccer ball and get get speed gunned and see how fast your shot was. And, you know, since it wasn't working, who's to say that I'm not shooting a soccer ball still at about 70, 75 miles an hour? Like, who's to say that's not true? Because that's what it felt like when it left my foot. But, you know, we'll have to see next home match if, if that's up and running. They've got some soccer tennis courts set up. They even had those little soccer games where, like, you sit at a little table, but then there's a little uh, pitch underneath the table and you're just kicking like underneath and trying to shoot the ball into the goal underneath the opposing person's seat. So there's a lot more little fun things to do. Uh, I put some pictures up of everything on, on Twitter and social media. So make sure you look for that. So that's great uh, that they expanded that. I really appreciated. Um, and I think this is one of the underrated season ticket membership perks is you get in a little earlier than general admission and you can enter in a separate gate. So you kind of get to this stuff a little earlier. So to me, that was worth it. Uh, a little added value from season ticket membership because my son and I got to participate in that. But especially we got to come in and go into the stadium. There were maybe a couple hundred people in their seats and we walked in and we just looked out and there was this real calm energy like there was, you knew something exciting was about to happen. You knew some spectacular things were about to go on. Like I could almost look out onto this pitch and just kind of visualize certain plays of the past. So like it, you almost could hear the roar of the fans before anyone was in the stadium. It was a real cool kind of energy. And looking at my seven-year-old son just kind of staring out, it was almost like he kind of had that little mist out on the pitch, like almost a hollowed battlefield, if you will. And, and I, I don't like comparing sports to war, but it was almost like that mist over uh, a battlefield or hallowed ground, and it was just this silent, calm energy. And then you started to kind of look around, and you see the fans coming in, and you see uh, the players and some of the staff kind of checking the field out a little bit, warm-up start, and it starts to get bumping. It was a real cool moment. And, and I encourage everyone, if you get the chance, to get to a game early, to take that moment and go into uh, the concourse and get close to the field and just kind of take that moment in before everything starts filling in. It was really neat. 
All right, that was me waxing poetic about Soldier Field in the pitch there. Uh, I don't know how many people have ever done that. So here, there's another special for the Feed the Fire show. A couple other quick game notes again before we get into some of the details. Um, I don't like Lucho Acosta. He's very talented. All he did was whine and complain to the ref the entire game. I think he had more whining than he did touches on the ball. I also really, really don't like Matt Miazga. Like he, you know, when he was center back for the U.S. And, and screwing around with Mexico and doing all that stuff, yeah, it was funny, but was it really effective? Was he effective as a player? Now, I mean, now he just looks like a jerk, and I'm being polite. He spent most of that game kicking Hugo Kuypers in the back of the leg and in the Achilles and then arguing with the ref. Honestly, and that's a good lead into because this ref was terrible. He was terrible. This was one game where you could say this replacement referee was way in over his head, tried to maintain control early on with some early yellow cards, one to Lucho Acosta for arguing, but then he pulled that card out so quick, like he could have given him another yellow card at any point later on in the game for the same and even worse complaining and arguing and dissent. But he didn't, because you know, he's not going to give a red card for dissent. So he really painted himself into a corner with that. He, he, The second half, all the calls went against Cincinnati. It was like I was watching a bad college basketball game where the referees are like, oh, we got we got a plus five foul advantage for the other team. Let's just start calling fouls for the other one and, and even it up a little bit. we got to get them both into the bonus if this thing's going to look fair. That's what it felt like to me, and there were so many calls in that second half, especially late in the game, as the Fire are trying to rally, and none more indicative of Brian Gutierrez is scrapping with one of the Cincinnati midfielders for the ball, and like the ball stays in place, but they're kind of spinning around and scrapping, and Gutierrez kind of shoves him off and is able to progress the ball, and then he gets called for the foul. And at that point, i got to say it was around between the 75th and, and 82nd minute, everyone, the booze came down, the ref, you suck chant started, and, you know, I caught my seven-year-old starting to chant, ref, you suck, and I look at him, and he looks at me like, is this okay? Is this, is this a safe place to say this chant? Can I do this without getting in trouble? And I just looked at him and went, go ahead. The ref does suck. This is terrible. He's hearing everyone complain about it. Let him cheer it. <laughs> so he had his moment of fun at the game. Uh, so that is kind of my general game notes, my general thoughts. But to really dive into some of the details and to really talk about this glass half full versus glass half empty, positive, negative, optimist, pessimist approach that I want to put tonight in, um, Let's look at some of the, the bigger issues. What are some of the bigger themes? And first, I, I want to start with the lineup. The Chicago Fire came out in a 3-4-3 lineup. Or you, if you really want to get nuanced, maybe it was a 3-4-2-1 with Kuypers being that one lone striker up front. They lined up with Brady and goal. Three in the back, Chihos, Pineda, Aragoni, who, by the way, Aragoni's had a couple solid games. I'm really starting to like him. And the fact that he came in to play right back and in his second full game, like official game with the fire, he ends up being a center back in a three back system and, and plays it really competently. Did not make any or very many mistakes in that match. Like I'm really starting to like him as a defender. That looks to be a good signing early on. So those are your three center backs. Herbers, Jimenez, Acosta, and Haile Selassie were your midfield line there, kind of your your defensive mid and wingers, wingbacks, wherever you want to call them, right? And that's why kind of giving it a 3-4-3 lineup, a 3-4-2-1, you really can't quantify it because the way the fire lined up, you could tell they wanted Herbers and Haile Selassie just running the wings. They wanted them just up and down the wings. When the fire were defending, they wanted them back deep. When it was a turnover, they wanted them counterattacking. When the fire were in possession, they wanted them pushing up and getting into the corners, which they didn't do so successfully, but that was the plan, essentially. You had your attacking midfielders and Gutierrez and Shakiri and your striker in Kuiper. So that was the lineup, and that was kind of the thought process. And if you're of the glass half full mentality with this lineup, you're thinking we needed to have these guys in the lineup. This is an attacking oriented lineup. You need to keep Cincinnati on their heels. We heard Herbers say in the training, uh, 
camp media availability the week before the game that Cincinnati likes to play with a five in the back or a little bit of a defensive-minded setup and then hit you on the counter. So they needed to be an attack-minding team to keep Cincinnati on the back heel, to keep those five, uh, that five-man back line back. Problem was, they didn't really do it. And that Cincinnati five-man back line looked like a three-man back line a lot of the time because their outside backs were pushing up. Uh, also, the idea was to take advantage of the home crowd, be much more attacking-minded, keep the get the crowd into it, keep the crowd into it, and get that early goal and keep the momentum, right? Keep the pressure on. That is that is the glass half full look about this lineup. The glass half empty. Klopas wet the bed with the lineup again. In the last two plus seasons or so, when the Fire have tried a three-man back line, a three center back formation. I don't think they have even drawn a game. They have all been losses to my recollection. The one game got Ezra Hendrickson fired. The one game should have gotten Frank Klopas fired if they had a backup backup plan. And here they come out with a three-man back line, a formation I hope they worked on in training. Obviously, we didn't get to see a lot of the preseason games due to broadcasting concerns and rights and whatever it was. Uh, so had they been training with a three-man back line, had they been playing this in the preseason, I don't know. It looked to be that they were rotating a lot of guys in the preseason. So this was a, a almost a calculated risk by the coaching staff lining them up in this manner. And I think it was a, a calculated failure. You want to call it a calculated risk? Fine. But it, it was a failure. The Fire have never had success with a three-man back line in recent history. And on top of it, if the idea was to be more attacking-minded, why is Kuypers playing as a lone striker up front? We saw his highlight video of all those goals he scored for Ghent a couple seasons ago. He was not a lone striker. He had a striking partner, and he was getting much better service than what Shakiri was trying to do in this match. Furthermore, if you wanted an attacking mindset, if you wanted Herbers and Haile Selassie to be flying up those wings... Why were those balls not played out into the corners a lot more? Gutierrez seems content to play more horizontal balls and to be more possession-oriented. Obviously, that's why Kellen Acosta is here. He's more of a possession-oriented defensive midfielder, right? Which they need, and I'm not knocking Kellen Acosta's style of play or that signing, but if if that's the, the play, Shakiri's not playing balls into the wing. You don't see Jimenez playing balls into the corners. He's not... He's not lobbing things forward for Haile Selassie and for Herbers. That that was not the case. I don't believe they got into those corners at all. And it, and the maybe the few times that they did, let me not speak in absolutes, right? I'm not a Sith Lord. I'm a lawyer. I don't talk in absolutes. But maybe the, the few times that Selassie did get the ball in the corner, he did not attack the defenders. He did not try to take them one-on-one. -on -one. So in my opinion, you should not have had Haile Selassie starting. You should have had Chris Mueller. He is more suited for attacking defenders one-on-one, -on -one, going quick, making a decision, not backing the ball out. By the time he got into the game in the 82nd, 83rd minute, there was no time for him to have any sort of an impact. And again, subs is another issue, right? I do like Marin Haile Selassie. He brings a lot to this team. We saw it last year, six goals and a lot of other opportunities. But for what they were trying to do here, I don't think Selassie was the right player for that. If they wanted to attack defenders and attack the outside, then they needed Mueller. And if they wanted to attack the inside, they needed a second striker up there, or they needed a better game plan for Shakiri and, Guti uh, and Gutierrez to progress the ball through the middle of the field and not just be lobbing balls forward and maybe trying to play some through balls to a winger coming in or to a Kuip on rushing Kuipers. So this was, to me, a tactical error. There was no changing in tactics throughout the game. The substitutions were too late and kind of like-for-like like subs within the system they were running that game. So I am now two for two. Uh, the the Actually, one for one right now. The lineup and the tactics, maybe two for two, on the glass half-empty side of things. But hey, if you know me, that's not a surprise. One of the other themes that's continued on into this season, the lack of offense. Here's the Chicago Fire's offensive numbers. Five shots, one on goal, and a 1.05 expected goal and that's according to the website fbref.com. By the way, that one shot on goal was Shakiri's PK. Here are the probabilities on their five shots. 
Herber's and Acosta had shots in the fifth minute. Herber's shot had a 12% chance of going in, Acosta's 4%. Shakiri's penalty was given a, a 79% chance of going in by FB Ref. Uh, and then after scoring, it was adjusted and it was given a 99% chance. So, you know, make of that what you will. Kellen Acosta's stoppage time shot, first half stoppage time shot, was given an 8% chance. And Gaston Jimenez's 61st minute shot was given a 2% chance. And by the way, when Jimenez lined that up, like the entire stadium just went, <gasps> like, oh my gosh, I can't believe he's doing this again. We've seen this movie enough. Stop shooting from 30 yards out, Gaston Jimenez. I don't know what he's trying to do with it. He's not fooling anybody. He's not good enough where it's like, oh, maybe the defense will have to step up and move their lines and stretch their their defensive spacing to go get him. Nope, not it. Not good enough. He's never gonna hit. Never gonna hit the target. Uh, so of those four shots that were not the penalty, the highest probability was a 12% probability. So again, the firearm did not have any offense going in this game. Now, the glass half full people, the optimists of the group, and then they're out there, will say the players need to gel. They haven't been playing together a lot. They need more time. They need to develop a rapport. You know, those, those Shakiri was like ah, almost there, like half a step off with Kuipers, you know, and I felt that way in the first half. And, and then the second half happened, and I changed my mind. But a lot of the glass half full stuff is reflected in head coach Frank Lopas. And here is his post game quote on this lack of offense. Quote, what needs to be done? I think we had a good game plan going again, going in against this team, how to attack them. I think our ability, we tried to get Guti and Shaq closer to Hugo at certain times. So he's not alone. I think we did a good job. You know, I think it's little things. I think maybe the final pass. I think it's details. I think they defended the box really well tonight. We need to keep being persistent. We need to, at moments, guys to take more risks in certain moments. But I think our expected goals was were much higher than they were, so we got in good spots. Now we just, maybe it's the final pass that needs to be better, the delivery. It's the little details that we need to keep working on. End quote. What game? was Frank Klopas watching. Let, let me break this quote down again. I think we had a good game plan going in. I didn't see it. I didn't see a game plan. I just saw you just trying to let your guys play. And you can't do that at this level. Um, it's the little things. I think maybe the final pass. All right, I'll give him this. Maybe it is the final pass that needs to be better. The delivery, like he said. Because, yeah, Shakiri was just lobbing balls. By early on in that second half, he's just lobbing balls forward, seeing if Kuypers can get there. Like, he is he is turning possession into a 50-50 opportunity. That is not how you create offense. That is not how you win games. That's not how you sustain offense. That's not how you do anything. That is how you have terrible-looking statistics and how you consistently lose. Because you have possession, and you take your possession and turn it into a 50-50 by just chipping a ball over the top and see if Kuypers can get to it before... Keeper comes out before the center back gets there. And again, we saw early on, Miazga was hacking Kuypers. Adjust the game plan somehow. Uh, let's see. I think they defended the box really well tonight. We need to keep being persistent. Defended the box? The fire didn't even have the ball in the box. They were just playing long ball. They the, the Cincinnati didn't have to defend in the box. The fire weren't there. Let's see, what else does Klopas say? I think our expected goals were much higher than they were. You want to know? According to MLSsoccer.com, Cincinnati had a 1.7 XG and Chicago had a 1.1. But according to FBref.com, Cincinnati had a um, 0.9 expected, I'm sorry, yeah, 0.9 expected goal, and the fire had a 1.05. So depending on which statistical model you look at, uh, Cincinnati was about even with or a little higher than Chicago, but definitely not, as Klopas put it, expected goals were much higher than ours. No, we got into good spots. No, you didn't. You had four shots. You did not get into good spots. Uh, I, I, To me, this is like actual evidence, evidence, evidentiary proof. There's there's evidence here that shows that Klopas and his coaching staff 
aren't looking at the numbers. They're not analyzing their team's performances. I bet they've never even seen a heat map and, or a passing chart. And they're just operating off feelings and vibes and the eye test and what seems to look good. Or maybe he knows everything is terrible, but doesn't want to say it to keep the morale up. Well, I'll tell you what. I already saw the first crack in the morale, and we're in game two. Because there was a point in that second half when Shakiri lobbed a ball up to try and get it to Kuypers, but again, turned possession into a 50-50, and the, the center back was able to body him up, play the ball away from, from Kuypers, and you just saw Kuypers have that moment of frustration where he throws his arms to the side, looks up in the air, and just kind of like stops. And it was a real quick moment, and I don't know if anyone else caught it, but it was there, and he did a really good job of not letting his body language show uh, for, for large parts of that game, but you could see he was getting upset with the with the delivery that, that he was supposed to be getting, and in this case, not getting. So so if you go back to Klopas' quote, and you take it for what it is, that's your glass half-empty, pers- or half-full perspective. For me, though, once again, shocking here, listeners, viewers, I'm glass half empty, and the glass half empty approach to this lack of offense is Shakiri's lazy, just lobbing balls forward. Klopas doesn't have a plan how to integrate Kuipers into the offense or how to bring offensive subs into the game. The players individually are not creative enough to make anything happen on their own, and there's no tactical or flex- tactical flexibility in this squad, right? And this has been a criticism of Klopas throughout his coaching career. Love him or hate him, I think you could. I think everyone agrees that his tactical adjustments and substitutions are not good enough for MLS. So there is the offensive theme. The next theme: starting the season with a draw at Philly and a loss home to Cincinnati. You know, one point in the first two games. Now, if you're if you're a positive person, if you're seeing sunshine and rainbows and petting puppy dogs, it's only two games. There's a lot of season left, right? The players need time to gel together. They need to work together. The hardest part of the Chicago Fire schedule is the first kind of third to half of the schedule. You will be fine. You just got to give it time. There's going to be reinforcements coming in the summer transfer window. Don't you worry about it. The Fire are are not going to have tired legs because they're not participating in U.S. Open Cup. They're sending the MLS Next Pro Club. More on that in the second half of the show. They'll be fine. It's early. Glass half empty. Us people living under rain clouds. This is still the same old Fire. They had a hard first half of the schedule last season, and look what happened. They were not good enough. They were not coached well enough. They did not have it, the it factor. They didn't catch any breaks. They were not good enough to dig themselves out of this first half of the season hole. Last year, through their first four matches, they had one win and two draws. This year... If you assume that they're going to lose to the crew this weekend and then beat Montreal the next, they'll have an even worse start of the first four games. So, glass half empty. The Fire have shown us nothing will be different except the names on the roster. So, obviously, it's fair to say at this point in the season, the sec- two game into the season, I am glass half empty on the Chicago Fire. But, hey, maybe with a glass half empty, you can't put out the Fire Maybe that's a good thing. But at the very end, I'm going to need a lot of empty glasses to deal with this Chicago Fire team. All right. What I always like to do after a game is kind of look at the stats as well. A little more than what we talked about, just to see if it kind of matches up with the eye test and kind of keep keep track of some of these numbers throughout the season and see when the Fire have better passing games, better offensive games, things of that nature. So to recap the stats, the goals, uh, the opener was by Bupenza of Cincinnati in the 39th minute. Just just a, a terrible, terrible defensive mistake by Rafael Chijos. Um, y- you saw Alex Campbell tweet it out. He committed the cardinal sin of defending, and that's playing the ball back across the front of your box. And uh, Bupenza gets the ball right at the edge of the 18, and from there it's just a shooting drill. Just like you've worked on training since you're a kid, you get the ball at the top of the box, pick a corner and shoot. And he drilled it low and hard 
to Brady's left. Brady had no chance. It was, it was essentially a long PK, and, and he drilled it. Shakiri gets the equalizer in the 45th minute on a penalty kick. Kind of a questionable penalty kick call. There's definitely worth the review there. And the referee thought that it was something, uh, that there was contact, that there was a foul on Gutierrez in the box, and the fire get the PK. I don't know. Is that a makeup call? If the referee's using that as a makeup call, again, terrible officiating. Uh, but as a fire fan, I'll take it. And we go into halftime tied 1 1. But the th- another theme of the night that is only glass half empty, so that's why we didn't analyze it before. Set piece defending, corner kick defending. Uh, the Chicago Fire give up just a little tap in to Miles Robinson on a corner kick in the 68th minute, and that's all Cincinnati needed to hold on for the 2 1 win. Continuing on with the stats, uh, Chicago ended up with 51% of the possessions. It was a very evenly possessed game. I I will say that. To me, that matches the eye test. The game kind of ebbed and flowed as far as possession went. Again, the Fire had five shots, one on goal. Meanwhile, Cincinnati had 13 shots, five on goal. Uh, One block shot for the Fire, 431 total passes, so similar to last week. 85.6% passing accuracy. To me, when you have a team that's passing in the mid 80% and higher, that suggests that most of the passing is coming in your defensive third, especially with a team like Cincinnati that is not pressing uh, or counter-pressing as much, that they are kind of waiting until you get into the middle of the field to draw their line of confrontation, if you will. So to me, this shows that the fire possessed the ball, in the defensive areas, in the midfield, and it lines up with the fact that they weren't creating much offense. Also, three corner kicks and 10 total crosses, one offside. No offensive, uh, no movement in the offensive zone there. Nine aerial duels won. At least they beat Cincinnati in that category to since he's four. Uh, Three saves by Chris Brady. You guys just feel for Chris Brady. You just kind of feel bad for him when his defense just lets these things happen. Uh, Fired 18 clearances, 16 fouls, three yellow cards. And fortunately, though, no red cards. And so that is our wrap-up and analysis of the Fire's return to red home opener loss 2-1 to FC Cincinnati. And at this point, we are going to take a short sponsor break and hear uh, from our featured guest, John Donovan. And John Donovan's segment, as well as the show, is brought to you by Skira Icelandic Spring Water. Icelandic for clear, Skira water comes from a spring in a government-protected nature preserve in Iceland with naturally low mineral content. This isn't your average water. Clearly, pun intended, it's one of the best. And with recognizing Skira available at your local 7-Eleven, we're going to turn it over to our good friend, John. Take it away. Nick, John Donovan here talking about the Chicago Fire and the MLS. Nick, we had a game this week against Cincinnati. I really, I I was amazed at the lineup. I was pleased in a lot of spots. I thought some things would work a lot better, but unfortunately it didn't. The the way the lineup was written was Shakiri was going to be out to the right, um, Kuypers in the middle, and and Herbers or... Somebody on the left, um, I think Gutierrez, I'm sorry, Gutierrez on the left, with Herbers, Jimenez, Acosta, and Haile Selassie underneath, and then only a three-man back side. And, um, you know, I, I that works. Three-man defense works, but it's very important that each guy knows their position. And as we go on in this, uh, we'll talk about a guy that didn't know his position and gave up the goal that lost the game. Um, the big change I thought in this game, Nick, was Acosta. He really is better than I thought. He's smooth. He um, he does a lot of things on the field that are good. I mean, he gets the ball. He shoots. His position is at the top of the uh, the penalty area, which is really where those def- those off halfbacks should be. I mean, it's if you play it back, they should be right there. And we haven't had that steady positioning. Um, for a long time. So the game started out and the fire were dominating. They had the ball down in their end for quite a while. And then it hit like that 32 minute period and it just, the game turned kind of negative. It was just back and forth between defenses, um, just kind of waiting for the other guy to make the mistake. And what happened at the 39th minute 
and I did talk about playing people out of position. Um, old Frank Klopas moved um, Sijos over to the left side rather than use Dean, who was a good player. And our buddy, the captain, or not the captain anymore, um, Sijos, he passed the ball right into the foot of the center forward for Cincinnati, who buried it. So Frank Klopas, another Klopas deal, he thinks that people can just pick up positioning and it just doesn't work that way. It's like putting Mickey Mantle at, uh, as a catcher. Unbelievable. That's on Klopas, that, that goal. The second half, there wasn't a lot of things happening early on in the second half. The uh, Cincinnati sort of buried the fire down in their end and they got three or four corner kicks out of one play, and uh, my man Robinson just side-footed one into the goal. Brady had no chance at it. I thought Brady had a pretty good game. I really did. He had some very nice um, uh, quick adjustments. He seemed to come up with things. But, you know, I, I, I want to go back to that uh, Klopas deal of changing people's positioning. I will never understand why he does that, especially when you're starting three in the back and you have two guys on the bench that you recruited to play those positions. So you take a guy who's who's been a center full or center fullback his whole life, throw him over the left, and he kicks the ball directly to the center forward who buries it. So whose goal is that? Is it is it the guy that moved out of his position and didn't really know where the passes went, or is it Frank Klopas who knew that that could happen? I would say it's Klopas. Um, you know the the, the crowd seem pretty good in the stadium now they 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 are very tricky with the cameras they'll kind of play the lower level behind the fire bench all the time and it um it appears as if there's a lot of people but it did when they pan back quite a bit i was surprised that uh there did seem to be some people in the stands now that's nick that is on light of the fire not even having their game scheduled in the daily herald or the Sun-Times. I'm not sure of the Tribune. I mean, they get no press. The only press or the only talk that goes on about the fire is through these podcasts and I'm sure social media. But what a disaster. They, You know, down in St. Louis, it's down in the papers all the time, in Dallas, in Portland, all over the place. I'd say the Chicago fire are the least um, noted team in the MLS. It's almost as if we don't we don't exist. Um, you know, the newspaper thing, the first goal um, that, you know, one other thing, Shakir, you, you just got to laugh. I mean, he was playing rotten and um, Gutierrez got a penalty kick, which was a very soft call, extremely soft call. Um, he got a penalty kick. So who do they give the penalty kick? They should have given it to Kuypers because he really is dynamic with that. But they gave it to our man Shakiri and he scored. And then he proceeded to look like a rooster after he just won a chicken fight. He's walking around saluting fans, doing everything for $8.2 million. He scored a penalty kick. Unbelievable. The cockiness of Shakiri just drives me crazy. We had guys on teams I played with that were cocky, but they were nice, and they didn't go out and want all the, the crowd to be pouring all over them. It just, I don't know. The fire really goofed up with that signing. I think Kuypers is going to be good. Who played good and who played bad in this game? Who played good? I thought Acosta had a heck of a game. Really smoothed out that midfield. Pinera, I think Pinera had a good game. He's a very capable uh, American soccer player. And Kuypers, even though he didn't score... Nobody could get the ball into him. I mean, it, it really was very clogged up, but I don't think Selassie or Gutierrez was really looking for him, which is odd. Who played bad? Selassie. I thought he had an awful game. He didn't get the ball to Kuypers. He could hardly get a shot off. He, they, they boxed him up on the side like I couldn't believe. It was his worst game. And Shakiri. Shakiri, hey, he had the penalty kick. But other than that, I don't know what he did. All his passes were long. The guys were chasing him to the end line. It just was a bad game. I think the fire would be so much better if they had Mueller rather than um, Selassie or start Selassie and Mueller on the left side, put Gutierrez in the middle, 
and let him run the squad the way he wants to do it because Shakiri is just clogging up the action in there. So that's about it, Nick. Um, always enjoy talking about the fire. Hey, Mike, take care, guys. John, thank you so much for your feedback, your analysis, and your breakdown. As always, we appreciate you uh, sending in your thoughts. Wanted just to touch on a couple things you said real quick, just to add a little more info. As far as the uh, attendance in the crowd, they actually announced over 26,000 fans in attendance. So the, the return to red, the home opener, the beautiful March 2nd weather on the lakefront. I think all of this contributed to uh, a higher than normal attendance for the Chicago fire as of late. And yeah, it was a good atmosphere. You could definitely feel it. Uh, also, I did, did want to highlight what you said about Mauricio Pineda. Excellent, excellent game by him again. That guy just goes out and plays good MLS soccer Every time he's on the pitch, he takes professional fouls. And and there was one, I forget who it was, in the, late in the second half, committed a professional foul, broke up the counterattack, gets the yellow card. Matt Miazga, go figure, comes flying in, shoves him in the back. And what's Pineda do? He just keeps jogging. He just jogs back to his position in, in the center of the, of the defense there and does not give Miazga the satisfaction of getting him all riled up. So I have grown to really respect his game and his attitude, and I think he is – he's probably been one of the, the best players on the fire over the last three years, like as a total complete player, right? Not just the skill, the potential, the signing, the highlights, but just – as a member of the team, I think he has been undoubtedly one of the best since uh, getting consistent starting minutes. And there's actually some chatter on Twitter about why isn't Pineda the captain? I think he's just got a little bit of that soft-spoken leadership, so maybe not what the fire need at this point. Uh, but wouldn't wouldn't hurt. Wouldn't be opposed to it. All right, let's get into next weekend's matchup. It'll be here before you know it. The Chicago Fire are traveling couple states over to Ohio and there were some chants of Ohio sucks in the stadium after the game and fine chant it whatever it's not like we can beat their teams right now uh but the Chicago Fire will be facing the Columbus crew this weekend and it really is out of the frying pan and into the fire for the men in red here you've got the defending MLS Cup champs they've got an informed star striker in Cucho who I typically don't start players in my fantasy team if they are playing against the fire, but I might have to keep them in for this one. I don't know. Um, this game could get ugly really fast. Let, let's be honest here, fire fans. The, the fire are coming off of a huge disappointment, and so are the crew. Uh, they get a good opening day win, one nothing against Atlanta United, a, a good team in their own right. And you can tell that the crew didn't play up to their potential and that they're still getting into form a little bit. Well, then in the second week, they draw Minnesota United. Minnesota United, a team who just got a new head coach like the first week of the season, who really doesn't have their whole roster put together the way you'd want a competitive team to be put together. I think they still got Emmanuel Reynoso, but who knows how that could go, right? Somehow they draw the crew 1-1. I think the crew are really going to take a lot of their frustrations out on the Chicago fire this weekend. And for the fire to be going away to one of the top teams in the East, I think you're going to see them try to go defensive. And that's what a lot of the chatter has been. And that's what I would expect to see as well is that the fire are going to go very defensive here. Hey, for all we know, Klopas could say, screw it. Let's go and, and attack balls to the walls kind of a thing. And just, just, Pure chaos. And hey, maybe that's what the fire need at this point. But I expect a much more pragmatic approach. I would go with a more pragmatic approach if I were coaching. And I think they're going to go defensive. They're going to park the bus, bunker counter, whatever you want to call it, and play for that point on the road. Now, they're never going to say they're playing for a point on the road. But after the fact, they're going to say, oh, yeah, you know, a point on the road is good. Just like happened with Philly, right? They were playing for the win and then had to settle for the point on the road. And also, I think the Fire are going to be more defensive because it was kind of their game plan at home against Cincinnati, I think, not to be defensive, but to look to counter and play quickly to Hugo Kuyper. So what I would expect and what I would want to see is if you're going to go with this defensive game plan, instead of playing a three center back system and then trying to overload the midfield, because uh, you know that 
your midfield can't match with their midfield. I would expect the fire to go to a five-man back line and just let Columbus have like 70 to 60% possession. Just let them knock the ball laterally. Let them knock it around. As long as they're not getting into striking areas, dangerous areas, zone 14, as it's known, that area just outside the penalty box where Bupenza got his goal this weekend. As long as they're not getting the ball into there, uh, I think the Fire have a good chance of really kind of slowing the game down and forcing the crew to kind of get to to dribble through them, to pass through them, and to really create. Now, the fr- crew can do that. That's the thing. You know that if you try to go toe-to-toe with them, they're going to torch you. But if you can really slow this game down and keep the crew going sideways, maybe that gives you a better shot. And then maybe you actually do hit Kuipers on a good counterattack or get Mueller alone uh, in a one-on-one situation on the wing, and he can attack. Maybe Gutierrez remembers what he did just a week or two ago in Philadelphia and take that shot from the edge of the box when he has that opportunity. All right. Crew, though, they have played in their two games a 4-2-3-1 and a 4-3-2-1 formation, but we know it's very fluid, and they have such excellent passing midfielders in Darlington Nagby and in Aiden Morris that whatever the starting lineup is, it's more of their defensive shape than it is their offensive shape. We've talked about Cucho as the main attacker, and if you don't know Cucho, you haven't been watching MLS for the last two years. But Diego Rossi can also act as a second striker. He's a guy who I have come also to dislike very much because of just the whiny way he plays, the way he's always arguing with the ref, the way he's always looking for a call, the way he's always complaining about how he's getting hacked and this and that. And I, I just I just don't like him. That's just not what I would want if I was a coach of a team or if I was a teammate. He's a talented player. Use the talent. Don't use all these ridiculous whinings and workings the ref and stuff like that. Maybe I can see t- players trying to work the ref a little bit more because they're replacement refs now, but I, I don't know. I just don't like it. To me, it doesn't look good. It's not sporting. And honestly, it makes the game look bad, right? If there are other people, if the league really is trying to grow into a, a global brand, is that what you want to, want people seeing? Diego Rossi and Matt Miazga arguing with the referees and complaining about non-calls? I would think not. Maybe it is entertaining for some, but week in and week out, I get tired of it. And I get tired of watching Diego Rossi do it. I don't think he was that bad when he was with LAFC, but correct me if I'm wrong on that one. Anyway, he could be a second striker for them. Jason Russell Rowe also has gotten some good chances. He hasn't scored yet, and I hope he doesn't find his scoring touch against uh, the Chicago Fire. On the defensive side of the ball, if the crew had to have a weakness, would you call it goalkeeper Patrick Schulte? It's only his second season as a starter, third year with the crew. He's 22 years old. Can the Fire rattle him? I mean, the guy played for... For the crew last season, the crew had one of the top goals against averages in the league or goals against differentials in the league. So maybe he's the weak link. Maybe you get Mo Farsi and some of the other defenders pushing too far forward and the fire can counter. And I think that's what they're going to look to do. And I think that's the only way they're going to uh, get to play for a win, maybe pull out a draw. But we can't, can't not mention center back for the crew, Rudy Camacho, an excellent center back, MLS vet, knows what the crew wants. Like He's capable of snuffing out counterattacks on his own. What we don't want is a repeat of this last week, where Selassie holds the ball up, Shakiri's just lobbing 50-50s to Kuypers, Gutierrez falls into bad habits of lateral passes, and Jimenez starts shooting field goals from you know, 30, 40 yards out, right? We can't have that against the crew. You can't waste opportunities against the team that is let's face it a lot better than than you Chicago Fire so again I'm looking for the fire to go a lot more defensively to have a lot more uh purposeful meaningful kind of counterattacks not just Shakiri taking two touches and, and the second touch is, is a long ball somewhere into Kuypers hopefully Acosta can come in slow the game down uh, and and also kind of keep some possession and maybe play a few through balls. We'll see. But that's what I would look for, and that's what I would do if I were the Chicago Fire. And hopefully, like I said, you can get Kuypers or Mueller into some of those one-on-one situations. I'd love to see a lot more of Yorgos Kutsias uh, and see if he can't run down some balls or, or maybe be a little bit more of a hold-up player in, in this instance. But 
one thing at a time, start with the defense, shore it up, and then look to get a through ball to Kuipers. Shifting gears here from MLS action to the U.S. Open Cup, something near and dear to a lot of Chicago Fire fans and a lot of people in the Fire organization. The U.S. Soccer Federation, the stewards of the U.S. Open Cup now, have announced the new format for 2024. As you all know, MLS said, we're not participating in it. Uh, we've been carrying it too much. There's not enough investment. It costs too much from a travel perspective. There's no publicity. The purse isn't worth the effort. All these things, we're not playing with it. Well, U.S. Open Cup said, you can't just pull out of the tournament. And U.S. and the U.S. Soccer Federation said you can't just pull out of the tournament. We got to work together on this, man. You're if you pull out of this tournament completely, the tournament will die. And MLS said, okay, make it worth our while. What are we going to do here? So the compromise they worked on was that eight MLS first teams, senior teams, will participate in the U.S. Open Cup. Those will be the top eight teams in the Supporter Shield standing, but one of them will be defending the defending champion, right? So you got the defending champ, Houston Dynamo, and the next seven highest teams in the Supporter Shield standings. Now, I don't know if they're going to keep it that way going forward in the event that an MLS team does not win the cup, if they're if they're going to just take the eight top, but this is seems to be a temporary plan uh, just for 2024. In addition to those eight MLS first teams, 11 MLS next pro teams will also compete and that is the Chicago Fire they will be sending CF2 to the US Open Cup again this was the compromise to keep MLS involved in the tournament better to have this and I will say it better to have this compromise than no MLS teams in the tournament and ultimately sounding the death knell for the US Open Cup now I know there are some people out there who just don't care about MLS and want their D1 and sanctions stripped and this is tradition and this is American soccer culture and how dare you change it? How dare you change things from when I was a kid and when I was younger? And, okay, now you just sound like old Grandpa Simpson, right? Like, old man shakes fist at cloud. How dare you change things? Like, that can't be your argument. I get the sentiment. Trust me, I don't I don't like MLS not participating fully in this tournament either. But your 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 reaction can't just be, grr, I don't like change. And let's be honest, traditions change. Thankfully, our traditions change, and I don't have to go to my crazy aunt's house for Christmas anymore, <laughs> right? We can go someplace else. Okay, bad example, but still, traditions are gonna change, right? Soccer in the United States is about change. How many leagues have come and gone? How many iterations uh, of USL have we seen? How has the MLS grown from 10 clubs to now 29 with others on the way, right? So soccer in the United States is change. The U.S. Open Cup was that one kind of constant where everyone could come together and get behind it. But we're seeing a lot more fans newer generations of fans as well as newer generations of investors and owners saying there is no money there is no interest in the u.s open cup right and to a certain extent are we seeing it in england with the fa cup no one really pays attention to it until the the premier league teams get into it yeah you love the david and goliath matchup but as was it henry bushel bushnell in his yahoo sports article said if you love the david and goliath you gotta have the goliath Right, so you gotta have MLS be a part of this. Um, one other thing I want to respond to to people saying strip their D1 sanctioning. You can't go nuclear at the very beginning of your negotiations. It is not good negotiating. It shows you are acting unreasonably and in bad faith. And God forbid this ever goes to court, because we don't need MLS and Soccer in America in court again you're going to show how unreasonable you are to any sort of judge or mediator in, in these cases. You can't go nuclear first, all right? That can't be your opening position right out of the gate. And remember, Major League Soccer is the most successful soccer league in American history. So what are, whatever your feelings are towards the league, towards Don Garber and these greedy business owners, that's just a fact. MLS is the most successful league in the United States. They've produced the most players. They've produced the most investment. They've produced the most growth in the sport, right? USSF and USOC need MLS, so they accommodate it, right? That's that's not my opinion. That's just the facts of it. And that's what I want to put out there. Again, I am angry about this too. 
Domestic cup competitions mean something. These tournaments mean something to me. That's what I lived for as a kid. It wasn't playing my regular season game. Uh, it wasn't playing, you know, running out to practice. It wasn't playing the, the same five or six teams every year, knowing how they're going to play. It was the tournament play. For me as a kid, I loved the tournament format. I was so upset that my high school team was in not in a conference. We were an independent school, and we couldn't get to play in any sort of these cool tournaments during or preseason. We just had to wait till kind of sectionals and things like that. I love tournaments, especially the U.S. Open Cup, especially domestic cup competitions. Those mean things for fans here uh, and for clubs here in the U.S. And we all know it as Fire fans, Kings of the Cup, right? Four, four U.S. Open Cup titles tied for most of any MLS team. One more would, put, would tie them for the most of any club ever, I think. Is there? Maybe we're going. Maybe I'm. My history is not going back far enough. But you know, the Fire would probably be a top three team if they were to win that fifth U.S. Open Cup title. And I thought U.S. Open Cup was a great way to show off Major League Soccer to the rest of the country and not have them just look like this monopolistic conglomerate corporate soccer business, but like you, they could watch these MLS teams play against their local teams and go, wow, these guys really are good. The MLS is onto something here, bringing in talent from all over the world while growing at home side, right? Homegrowns and academy products and interleague transfers and draft picks. This was all on display at the U.S. Open Cup. And I haven't looked at the roster rules lately, but at, there was a time when you had to have a minimum number of, of American players on your roster. And that was another way to feature players and get their names out there and get them at least into training with some of these first teams. So I love the U.S. Open Cup and Domestic Cups for all these reasons. But at the same time, I get it from an MLS business perspective. They've been carrying this tournament, especially financially. They didn't want to do it any longer. So without enough investment or attention... I can see why they picked up their ball and went home. Or should I say, picked up their ball and went over to Mexico and started the League's Cup. After, whew, I need a, I need a breath there. <laughs> Let me open a few more links here and get ready for the next segment while I catch my breath, right? So let's real quick do a quick roundup of things going around the league. Looking at some of the scores over this last week that were really surprising to me. I already talked about Minnesota and Columbus drawing 1-1. That RSL score shocked me. RSL 3, LAFC 0, the snow game. A ridiculous time to be playing soccer in several inches of snow, and they let it go on. I don't know if the replacement refs just didn't have the cojones to say we're going to call the game, but there were several delays for the weather to show to whatever, and they just ended up playing it. It was insane. And then, of course, you get Chicho Arango doing snow angels after his goal. Also crazy result, Miami 5, Orlando City, my preseason Eastern Conference, top of the table, and many others, 0-5-0, zero. Zero, Herons over Lions. Uh, Messi with a goal, Suarez with two. I forget who had the other two. Uh, when they showed the score on the scoreboard at Soldier Field during the fire game, and it was 5 nothing. You heard, like, kind of a, a gasp come up, like, whoa, did you guys see that? And, like, people were whispering, like, do you see that? And then people are pulling their phones out, like, really? 5 nothing? How many did Messi get? This is crazy. So that was a wild game. And if Miami can keep this up, I don't see how they don't win multiple trophies this year. That is a massive, massive, massive if. Riding on the knees of all these former Barca players who are in their mid to late 30s still running out there week in and week out. Uh, looking at any other shocking results, nothing really shocks me here. DC Portland played to a 2-2 draw. Two teams who had big opening weekends with a good draw uh, and then coming in with a with a draw. So that bodes well for a Portland team who maybe they still think they can win something this season and a DC team who's trying to bounce back. Uh, and then we see Toronto beating New England. Not a good start for New England, but Insigne with, the, with a cheeky little chip over the keeper to get the one nothing victory there. So those are some of the scores that st stood out for me this week. Some of the transfer headlines that stood out, FC Cincinnati, after defeating the Chicago Fire, still doing some business. They have acquired DeAndre Yedlin 
from Inter Miami with a very specific dollar amount of, of general allocation money, $172,799 in GAM. And this is, I think, is a, this is a great move for FC Cincinnati. They want another trophy. They bring in a veteran soccer player, MLS veteran, Premier League veteran, international U.S. veteran, playing outside back. They're bolstering their defense, and he can also still, I can still in some bursts, get forward and get into attacking, play a little bit of that wingback role. So a fantastic signing for FC Cincinnati to really bolster their squad. I don't know how much he's going to be starting, but he can definitely be worked into a starting rotation for a team that's playing in a few different tournaments this year. Uh, there was another little bit of transfer news. I'm trying to find it here um, real quick. Uh, Cincinnati have loaned Alvaro Barreal to Brazil's Cruzeiro. Um, Ozzy Alonso, the MLS legend, has signed a one-day contract with Seattle so he can retire with them. Um, Adama Diomande has been waived by TFC, so that's something to keep uh, keep an eye on if he ends up with another team. And I think that is everything from a transfer tracker's perspective and you can go check out the transfer tracker uh, on mlssoccer.com as we know the galaxy signed Painsill. he's already had an impact uh columbus crew have signed mo farsi the other not official transfer news is that carlos vela the first ever designated player for lafc and i believe the first ever captain for lafc former mvp former golden boot winner trophy winner with lafc is being courted by the San Jose Quakes, and a deal is close to being done. So keep your ears and eyes peeled for that. And with that, MLS fans, Fire fans, soccer fans, thank you for tuning in again. Please make sure you are sharing the info for the show with your friends, with your family, with your enemies. Heck, let's get everyone on board. Maybe your enemies will become your friends for your love of soccer and this podcast. So please keep supporting. Email me. Find me on social at Glasshouse Soccer. Uh, look for me Tuesday, March 5th on the CHGO Fire podcast. And as always, let's go fire.